And welcome into Facebook Live. I'm Stan the Fan Charles of Facebook, of Pressbox, not of Facebook, of Pressbox <laughs> and PressboxOnline.com. Joining me as he does most Wednesday nights, but we're on Thursday this week, Gary Stein. Gary, how are you? I'm good, Stan. I'm not with Facebook, so just to let you know. I, you should be with Facebook. <laughs> you have that look. Thank and joining you. us is an old friend and somebody I'm really anxious to talk to. He is currently the Deputy Director of Athletics, Men's Basketball, and External Affairs at Duke University. He's an old friend and a fellow Orioles fan, so the three of us have that in common. He Good. is John Jackson. John, how are you? I'm great. How are you guys? I'm doing great. Excited to talk to you. Um, you know, when I heard the news in June that Coach K was stepping down after the 21-22 season, I said, I got to get John on a Zoom. So I know I wasn't going to get Coach K on, uh, but I said, I got to get somebody on to talk about what it's been like to work with this man for so long. But I start with just, was it shocking to you when you got the news, when he confided in you that he was going to announce this? No, not, not, not overly. I mean, it, it's, I mean, you know, coach is 74 years old. It's not the first time that, uh, that that conversation has come up over the years. Um, you know, so I, no, I wasn't overly, overly surprised. I was always in the camp though, until he actually walked in and said it was happening and that we were actually going to have a press conference. Then until then I was like, it's not happening. And, um, you know, so he did that in, you know, he did that in May and, um, we started to put, put a plan together. So, um, no, I'm not, not overly surprised by it. Um, uh, you know, and, and this year we're, we're doing the best we can to kind of keep it as normal as possible for them, given the amount of requests that, uh, that we have. We always have a lot, but this year we've had a few, few extra. Before I turn you over to Gary and we get into sort of some stuff about this season, I do have to ask you, 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 got, you graduated from Penn State, you worked briefly at Penn State, then you were at Florida, uh, University of Florida, for one year, then you were at SMU for five years, I believe. You came to Duke in 2000. Was Mike Krzyzewski, when you first met him, was he the same Mike Krzyzewski he is today? Did it mean that much to meet him as now that you know him as what he is? So <laughs> a couple of things on that. One, um, the one thing that I will say has not changed in the 21 years I've been, been with coach, uh, his value set and, you know, his, his ethics and, and all the things that, uh, you know, that, that I admire so much about him, they have not changed. Um, he is, uh, a little less feisty these days. Uh, <laughs> he, he is definitely a little more thoughtful about, you know, maybe how he approaches a situation, a, you know, delicate situation. Um, you know, that, that has, that has changed over the years, but, um, you know, that, that value set, um, we may we may call things something a little bit different these days than we did uh, when I first got there, but it's it's still kind of that same you know West Point you know value set that uh, that is so ingrained in him. Um, the funny story is, so I interviewed at Duke and I did not meet Coach, knowing that I may work for the guy, and uh, they were getting ready to play a game at Michigan, so they were practicing. And uh, I never met him on the interview. So um, I got to Duke. It was in January of 2000. So it kind and of you interviewed. I'm guessing you interviewed with the, the athletic director, Joe Oliva, right? Yeah, Oliva. And uh, Chris Kennedy was uh, who's still our senior deputy at, at Duke. Been here 40. So he's been here longer than coach. Uh, he hired me. And um, anyway, but it was funny. So I, I get I get to Duke and and I, we, I had to navigate a, a really bad ice storm to get there, um, you know, late January of, of 2000. The first time I met coach, I was in the SID office sitting in my new office. I'm, I'm getting unpacked and and somebody rolls in and like big parka on and a, and a Cubs hat, like really pulled down <laughs> low. And I'm like, who is that? The first time I met coach, he's wearing a Cubs hat and, you know, it was all like bundled <laughs> up from the, and I'm like, oh man, this is going to be. This is going to be a ride, but and I, th I still to this day think it's the only time I've seen him in a baseball hat. Uh, pretty funny. So you know, John, that kind of leads me to my question. Actually, you kind of you kind of flitted in there a little bit, um, which is, 
you know, when, when we see him in general, it's in front of a mic or in front of a camera and it's on the basketball court and he's got that personality, right? He's got that professional basketball coach personality, but you see him differently. You see him away from the court. And so I wonder, picking up on the story of the first time you met him when he was wearing a Cubs hat, what's he like? What's he like on a day-to-day basis? So uh, a couple, a, a few things. One, um, I know when I, so about, I think it was October of 18 is when I went up to be the primary basketball administrator. Mike Craig was with him for a long time. Mike is now the AD at St. John's. Uh, he was, he was our basketball administrator for, oh man, it, since I got there. I mean, basically he was, he was there for, you know, for that amount of time. And, and um, I, you know, so I, 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 I had always worked with coach pretty closely, but it was more, it was very specific to media. Okay. So yeah. I get up there, I'm in, I'm in the, in a new basketball administrative role and I'm, and I'm actually housed in the same floor that, that coaches. And I, I could not believe the, I, I couldn't keep up with them. Like it, it's, hmm. it was that it was, it was really mind boggling when I first got up there. And I've said this to a bunch of people. I actually had to learn to forgive myself. I, I think I have pretty good work ethic and, and I, I think I'm, you know, pretty, pretty smart, but I mean, I, this guy can kind of make you feel a little bit inadequate. Cause it's, it's wow. like, he's, this guy's 71 years old and he's going a thousand miles per hour and he's going until all hours of the morning and he doesn't sleep and he comes in and does it all over again. And, and uh, it, it took me a while to, to learn how to just, Hey, it is what it is. And, and he's kind of a, we joke about him being an alien. He, he, he kind of is. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, the, the one thing, um, the, the other thing is coach's sense of humor is as good as any person you'll ever be around. He doesn't often show it, uh, publicly. Um, you know, he'll joke around once in a while in a press conference, but he is a, he's really funny. And he uses humor to kind of diffuse a lot of situations where things are, they're going haywire and, you know, we're all beating our heads against the wall and, you know, he, a really well-timed joke or, you know, something like he's giving you a little bit of grief is uh, it, it always helps, but he, look, he, he um, personally, I owe him a lot and um, he's super loyal. He's the first guy who called me when my son was born. He's the first person that, uh, you know, when, when I got married, I mean, he's, he's always kind of the first, when my father died, he was the first person to call me. Like he just has this sixth sense about people and he knows how to, he just knows how to work, you know, really well with people. And if, and if you're fortunate enough to be kind of be on the inside of that, it's, it's pretty special to see. I I can give you a thousand examples of things that it's like, wow, he did not have to do that uh, for anybody, you know, and, and uh, it, it, he, he's, he's really a, He's a once in a generation guy. And, you know, mm. coaching aside, he's a, he's that, that good of a person. Mm. He really- let me, let me slip one more in here, um, John. So, you know, I'm going to ask about something that actually predates you. Um, you know, a lot of people may not remember that when he first started at Duke, after he spent five years at Army, he wasn't successful. Correct. His first three years were losing seasons, basically. Yep. He had a losing record. And in that last season, the 82-83 season, if I'm not mistaken, that season was capped by a tremendous loss to Virginia. Virginia. A 43-point yep. loss to Ralph Sampson. And I know this for a fact, that Mike was disconsolate about it. I mean, he was questioning his ability. He was questioning his future, et cetera. And then the last 30 plus years, almost 40 years actually, have proven otherwise. My question, and maybe you've talked with him about this. My question is what changed? Like almost overnight, that program changed. Well, I think, I think it was heading in the right direction. I, I, you know, it's, it's a little harder for me to, to be specific because I wasn't here at the time. Right. But I heard Coach talk about this a lot. And, you know, we have the fundraising group called the Iron Dukes. And then there was a group called the Concerned Iron Dukes. And he always jokes about they were concerned about him being their coach. <laughs> and um, but but he had a couple of things. He had he had someone in Tom Butters who believed in him. And we were really we were really close. And, um, you know, they end up 
they end up recruiting a, a you know that that recruiting class with uh, with Billis, Allery, Dawkins, etc., Henderson. Um, that it was common. It just they weren't quite there yet. Um, and thankfully, Tom Butters saw something and and knew that he had hired the right guy initially. Stuck with it. Um, I think it's a great lesson, uh, especially in the environment we live in today. Patience mm. may sometimes be a good thing. And, um, and changing a culture overnight is not easy. And we've seen it over and over again with coaching hires and AD hires and different things. And, um, you know, I, I think they were probably closer than their record had shown and in, in that performance against Virginia. Um, I, you guys have probably heard the story where they went out after the game and someone raised a glass and said, you know, here's the forgetting tonight. And coach said, no, 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 here's the never forgetting tonight. Correct. And coach, I, he is, he's as competitive as a human being as there is on this planet. And, um, you know, he, that, that actually, I think was a, was a, I don't want to call it a turning point, but it was a, it was kind of an inflection point for the program. I had the pleasure before I ask a question, I had the pleasure of covering Duke basketball. I didn't really have a job down there that needed me to be there, but I was able to, to, to be at the games and be at the press conferences for three years. There was not a single press conference that I didn't hear something out of him that just blew me away as being the smartest thing. One day he was talking about kids and parents and sports. And he talked about, the fact that the first question when Billy gets in the car after a game should be, do you have fun? Did you have fun, Billy? He says, but the parents today, how did you do? You know, they want to know how you did. Uh, and I always remember that. Do you have any examples of something like that where you just were blown away with his wisdom? I mean, there, there's a lot. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, yeah, there are always times where I, I catch myself like, you, you know, I'm around him a lot. So it I, sometimes it doesn't sink in. And then about like a half hour later, I'll be in my office like, wow, wait, 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 wait. That, you know, like a little tic tac bomb thing that went off. And like, wow, he just said something pretty profound. And, and uh, I, I guess we're a little used to it, which is yeah. probably a really good thing. Um, I, I, I think that the thing with, the thing with coach, I've just seen so many, so many like acts of generosity that he's not necessarily asked to do. And you see it and, and, and you, you kind of like, wow, I, I don't know that I could have thought of that, you know, like to do something for, he, he just knows like the right thing to say, the right thing to do, the right time to pick up the phone. And, um, it's, it's really, it's an uncanny sixth sense that he, that he has, um, on the basketball side of things, I've seen him, you know, do things, you know, motivationally that are like, you know, I mean, a lot of this I'm sure is going to come out like after he's done coaching. Sure. Uh, but I mean, some of the stuff I've seen over the years where it's like, wow, like, <laughs> like you know, cra like really he he's, he's unafraid you know, to try things. Let's put it that way. And it, it generally works. I got to ask you, you know, when I was down there in early two thousands, I think Johnny Dawkins was still his, his main Lieutenant. Yeah. And Johnny, I'm not saying he got, got tired of waiting, but it was, you just knew that coach wasn't anywhere near getting yeah, ready to yeah. retire. So Dawkins yeah. goes out to Stanford and he had mixed results. Uh, Chris Collins and Steve Wojciechowski were the next two guys that were there about seven or eight, nine years. They both got jobs at Northwestern in the case of Chris Collins and Wojo at Marquette. And now John Shire comes along. And was it just that the timing was right that he retired while Shire was here? Because I know there's two other guys or three other guys out there that would have loved to have had this job. Yeah, I, I think uh, timing and and the fact that uh, and you know coach has been very clear about this. I've been able to see it firsthand uh, since we've made the announcement. But um, John's also ready, 
you know, I mean, it, it's it, uh, two years ago. I don't know. And coach has been public. So I'm not saying anything that, that hasn't been said publicly already. Um, you know, co coach said he might not have been ready a couple years ago. He's ready. And I think that that factored into coach's decision, Okay. Uh, you know, frankly to, you know, Hey, we, we've got someone here We're you know, we're ready. If, if that's how the university chooses to go, we have someone in house that can do this. I think um, everyone sees the recruiting results so far that, that John has put together. Yep. Um, so I think, I think that uh, I think he was right. And um, yeah, I think timing is a huge part of it. I mean, you know, had it happened a few years earlier, Jeff Capel would have been in the mix because he yep. was the top. So we've had, we've had a run of very high end top assistants. Um, and no question, about you know, so John, yeah, right place. Uh, but I don't, I don't want to undersell the fact that John Shire is a really good basketball coach and, and, uh, and he's going to do really good things at Duke. Yeah. John, you know, you, I go back to a comment you made a little earlier about you, you work with him every day and at 71 years old, he's still sharp and working, you know, all the time, not sleeping, you know, taking care of everything. So obviously he hasn't lost steam there yet for, yet it's time. Right. It's time for him. What, why is it, though, if he's still sharp and working hard and all that stuff? Why is now the time? I think um, I think for him, he he actually really enjoyed being home this summer and not on the road chasing recruits all over the country. <laughs> I think that was uh, I think he enjoyed it, uh, quite frankly. And, and, and our team benefited from it because he was here and he was able to develop some relationships with our current team that. Uh, certainly in the COVID year, we couldn't do. And, and, and because he's had to, he had to be all over the country, you know, with, with recruiting, you're, you know, he's not in the situation made to develop those relationships as, as deeply as he would like to. The other thing we deal with a lot, we don't have them as long anymore. So yeah. you kind of have to cram it into a shorter time period. So this summer for him was amazing because he got to spend time with his team and, um, so I think that was a big part of it, the, the, the recruiting piece. And, and I just think, you know, coaches, uh, yeah, I mean, he – obviously everyone knows him as a basketball coach, but he, he's a lot more than that. And he's got other – he's got other things that – he loves the sport, and I don't think he needs to be coaching it to be involved in it. You know what I mean? He, he's going to have something to offer to the sport of basketball beyond just being a coach. And, um, and I, I think – I think he, it just, we, again, we've talked about this for a few years. It's not, it, it wasn't this huge, huge shock. I, I didn't think he would probably go out after the COVID year just because no fans. It just, it didn't last year just didn't feel right on every level to, to all of us. I mean, not just Duke. So I'll you know. give you a quick, I'll give you a quick insight, Gary, on this question. The last time we got together was the summer, like in 19, I think. And I said, when's coach going to retire? He said, not any time really soon. And you told me the anecdote about the day. I think they lost to Michigan in the, the grade eight. And you said he called a meeting the next day in Durham to sort of start planning for the next year. Yeah. And I was Michigan amazed State. at that. Yeah. We, yeah. we lost Michigan to Michigan State. State up in DC um, in uh, 19, I believe. And yeah, yeah, the next morning we were in the office and it was okay. What, like, what do we need to do? How do we get better? And, uh, and by the way, we were number one, most of that previous year. I mean, we yeah. were, you know, um, I think most would say that that loss was an upset, you know, we were probably the favorite going into that tournament. So um, yeah, he, he, he doesn't stop. And, and I think, uh, I think, you know, look, he's got 10 grandkids in the area, all his <laughs> daughters are in the area and I just, I think he wants to go be part of their lives a little bit more than he's been able to. And, and uh, it, it'll, it'll be a cool thing. Like I, I'm, I'm excited to see what a post coach coaching coach K looks like. I, I'm excited for him. And, uh, and I think uh, you know, he's going to stay at the school. He's going to be an ambassador for Duke and I'm sure they're going to have him involved. We, we, you know, have a capital campaign coming up and I have a feeling they'll leverage him. Uh, <laughs> a bit. Uh, so I'm actually excited to see what's next for him. It'll, and I think he is too. I think he, I think he's totally at peace with everything right now. 
John, if I could ask you also, and things have changed over the years, there's no doubt about it. I'm talking about ACC basketball, you know, just in general. I mean, clearly ACC basketball for years and years was the greatest conference in terms of the NCAA. And it still just may be the greatest conference. But if you kind of hone in on Durham, Chapel Hill and Raleigh, North Carolina, there's probably no other, not even probably, there's no other conference in the NCAA that has three programs with that pedigree literally biking distance from one another yep. and the great coaches and the championships and all the lore. And I'm just wondering, did that kind of motivate coach K even more like being in that particular situation? It's like the Yankees, the Dodgers and the giants all playing in New York at the same time. Yeah. Uh, um, I think, I think coach, like one thing we're, we've been really careful of over the years is, is to not, not make it, not make things about someone else. So yeah, there's measuring sticks. And, and, you know, obviously when, when coach got into the conference, you know, Dean Smith had, you know, arguably the best program in the country going at North Carolina, you know, so, so there's, they're measuring sticks, but you, you got to be careful not to go too overboard looking around at what everyone else is doing in particular in our area, because right. if you let the noise get to you, it can, it can be a problem. And, um, you know, so if you win in, in Chapel Hill in February, you can't, you can't think you're all that because guess what? You're playing them in about four weeks or three weeks and they might hand it right back to you in Durham. And, um, and then state, you know, obviously they've got a great history. I think, I think it's incredibly unique. Um, and, and trust me, I have stories at come postseason where there's three charter planes at the, at the airport and one is state and one is Carolina and one is Duke. And we're all going to our NCAA tournament site. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> wow. like, and we've had that before. Like, it's like, Oh, that's state. That's good. You can see people. It was, uh, we've had that. And, um, and so, you, you know, that's, it is incredibly unique, but I think, I think more broadly, like he's always focused on, we, we gotta, we gotta take care of our house and we gotta take care of our conference. And our conference across the board is a good measuring stick. Mm -hmm. you know? So we, we just happen. There's a lot more noise where we live about where it you all. live. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, Coach K always made it not about him versus Gary Williams or him versus Roy Williams. But there had to be a side of him that you saw about how those people brought out the competitor in him. Uh, I think he had a great deal of respect for Gary Williams, wanted yeah. to beat him every single time. Yep. But could you talk a little bit about his relationship with some of those big time other coaches? Yeah, he I mean, he and Gary actually, I think outside of the basketball court, like I think they really liked each other a lot. Yeah, I, I actually think so. they liked each other on the court. They're just competitors and, yeah. and they're both kind of fiery guys you know some maybe one a little more than the other but uh but no they're really uh he had the utmost respect for for gary williams and 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 obviously with with roy being at north carolina as long as he was but coaches never got into like what my record is against this coach because it's you got to throw it out a little because it's your team against their team and sometimes your team's really good and sometimes there's not and vice versa um you know, and the great thing about those games, most of the time, both teams were really good. Yeah. And, and I know in the early two thousands, when I first got here, um, you know, the, the Duke Maryland games for about three or four years were, were the, the best, best. games yeah. of the season and sometimes third game and sometimes a fourth game. Yeah. Great. And, and I, I'm telling you, they were, they were rock fights, all of them and high level pros all over the place, like high level games, uh, big time atmospheres. And, um, you know, uh, it, or, when I first got here, Carolina was actually a little bit down and Maryland yep. had kind of assumed that that place. number two position. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I don't want to say number two, cause they won a national championship, you yep. know, I mean, they, they, <laughs> you know, but, but we yeah, but fortunately five. we were always in Duke's there. Won yeah. five of them. Yeah, we, we were always in there with, with in that mix, which is a great <laughs> thing to be, so. 
but I miss I miss the I miss the Maryland games. I don't miss going to uh, to uh, is it still Comcast Center up there? It's called uh, the Xfinity. Xfinity. Center. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't miss going into that building very much. But I always got the impression that Coach was really ticked off that Maryland left the ACC. Uh, he, of course, can't control what they needed to do from a business standpoint, but his stance of not wanting to play them again, I, I always thought he was really disappointed that they were out of the ACC. Yeah, I, and I don't it, – I don't – we probably shouldn't pin that on coach. I mean, I don't know that Duke has played Maryland in much of anything since they've left the conference. And right. I know that's been, you know, been our stance is if you wanted to play us, you could have played us twice a year. Yeah. Um, so, um, sure. and, you know, and obviously I'm, I didn't, when I was in school, uh, Penn state wasn't a big 10 team, but I, you know, I still kind of follow Maryland cause now they're in my alma mater's conference and I, you know, you, you see, uh, you see it and it just doesn't seem like it's Maryland, Iowa same. doesn't excite me as much as Maryland, Georgia tech, you know, yeah. it's just, they are, they just, that's their roots, you know? And, uh, but they had, again, we're, we're, we're not in the room. We don't know what those institutional decisions are and they, you know, clearly yep. made, they thought the best decision for their school was and, and good for them. I did want to ask you, I don't want to put you on the spot of what, of who your conjecture as to who Maryland would hire to replace Mark Turgeon to step down. That's not my question. Yeah. But my question is, I know a lot of people here, Steve Wojciechowski was a local kid here and was really well liked and people wanted him to go to Maryland. He chose Duke. And because of that, he's somewhat despised or, oh, we can't, can't talk about him. When somebody does hire Steve Wojciechowski again, what kind of coach will they be getting, John? They're going to get as passionate of a coach as you're going to find. Um, you know, the, we were fortunate. One of his uh, his players, Theo John, is playing for us. He's a fifth right. year, and he came to play for us. And, I mean, he loved Woj. And uh, yeah. Chris Garrowell, who's our top – you know, one of our top assistants now, uh, he – you know, he loved working with Woj and, uh, you know, I know working with them here, like he will, I mean, he, he'll fight. I mean, Steve will fight and there is nothing he's afraid of. His dad was a longshoreman up there. Mm -hmm. Like, he yep. is, yeah, like he was. this guy is not afraid of <clears throat> anything and he will fight you. And, um, and I think that anyone who would have him uh, would be pretty fortunate. And if you look at Marquette so far this year, I know they went and made the, and I think Shaka Smart's a really good coach, but yeah. I don't know that it's moved the needle kind of compared to where Wojo was last, you yeah. know, the last few years. So um, I think he's a hell of a coach and, and I know he's a hell of a person. He's a, yeah. he's a stand up guy, ethical, really good, really good guy. You're not saying it, but I think he should be in the mix for the Maryland job because I think he'd do a super job there. Gary, you got a couple more? Cause I got one or two more, but. And then we'll let John get out of get get out of Duke and go home. Yeah, I've got a couple more, but just a comment. You you were talking about Wojo. You know, I remember actually when he was here in Baltimore playing at Cardinal Gibbons. It's so funny because Cardinal Gibbons isn't even around anymore. It's not even a school. Yeah. And his coach, Ray Mullis, who was one of the great high school coaches in Baltimore, has passed away. So, you know, it's just so interesting to have these conversations and kind of re-remember the past on how these, on, on how Wojo started and all that. But John, my, my question is, I've, I've always been curious about this. You know, you could tell a lot about a person by what their office says about them. And I'm just curious with all the national titles he's won and all the ACC titles, all the hardware that comes with it. And I know it's not in his office, right? It's probably out in a, in a beautiful glass case somewhere. I get that. But all the, all Americans, and the NBA players, is his office full of pictures of players or what is, what does his office look like? Great that, question, Gary. That is a great question. And, and his office is, um, there is not one square inch of that office that doesn't have a photo of some sort on it. <laughs> and he, it's funny, he's got, so um, he's got a USA basketball wall. He's got a kind of a Duke wall. He's got a, a bookcase behind his desk that is all army. He's got a family. It's interesting how he sections it off. 
and he's got um there there's one area in the back corner of his office where he's got like all these pictures like him and coach wooden him and coach smith uh you know him and coach williams uh the the uh patino Bayheim, williams k you know picture at one of the acc things uh the you know all the hall of fame coaches from there uh coach iba uh mm -hmm. chuck daly um and wow. he's got yeah, he's got he's got so many knickknacks and it's I mean, there's bobbleheads like Shane Battier championship bobblehead. <laughs> there's a there's a there's a thing of toy soldiers, uh, uh, Union soldiers marching that uh, Al McGuire got him at a flea market. Like it's mm -hmm. it's 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 a cool office. I mean, there's a but there's pictures everywhere. And then he's got um, at the top. He's, he's got a really high ceiling at the top of it. He's got all, all these, uh, bas uh, milestone basketballs and gotcha. there's literally like 50 of them up there, you know, hundred win, 200, hundred win at Duke, you know, like it, it just, it's crazy. It is. It's crazy. A lot of stuff from army, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of, a lot of personal stuff. It, it's a, it, yeah, it's a really cool, it, it's neat when people come up and he's not in there, you know, we always try to pop them in just to, just yeah. to go check it out. Cause it is cool. That's a, it's a great question. Good. Stan? I'll close by asking you what this season has been like to date, and what do you think is in store emotionally for Coach and the, the people that know him closest? I think uh, so. So far, so good. I mean, we we really needed to get to the season. Like, the off season was really, really uh, challenging this year um, because of all the extra. There's just – so many people want to talk to him. So many people want to interview him. So many, and we had to be really intentional how we're, how we're handling that. Um, I can tell you guys, like we we're not doing any retrospective things during the season. Like we, there'll be a time and place for that and we'll do it after. And if people are still interested in talking to coach, they'll be glad to talk to him, but we're not going to get looking backwards while our season's going on. Right. Um, so that's the, far, that's the, comp that's the competitor. Yeah. Man. Wanting no. to focus on these kids. hundred percent. And they yeah. deserve it. And, and he deserves it quite yeah. frankly, because you want that. I'm trying my hardest to keep this thing as clean and pure as possible. So he can really enjoy this last run he's got. Um, the other that, but as far as the season goes, um, it's been, I mean, we're seven and one. We have as good a resume as any team in the country. Um, we ran out of gas in the second half of one game. We've, we've really had one really tough half out of all of them. And, um, and I think anyone who's watching us knows it's a very different team than we had a year ago. And, uh, and it looks a little more Duke like this year, um, yeah. you know, where you can see the talent and, and you can see the cohesiveness and, um, you know, so, so far so good. We feel, we feel really good. And, um, We've had some big time games already and hopefully those will hold up as good resume, you know, games, you know, come, come selection Sunday, but uh, we feel great where we're at. Last question I've got for you. And I take a little bit of credit for you and John Maroon becoming such good friends because I worked out sort of telling John, I said, Hey, I know these guys at Duke, if Cal would ever like to go down. So he brought Cal down to a game and you got to know Cal and you got yeah. very friendly with John Maroon. Have you reached out to John to sort of talk what a farewell tour is like because of how he handled some of Cal's last, last stuff? You, you're damn right. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, no, awesome. John, and, I, John and Carolyn are some of our, actually some of our closest friends and, yeah. uh, and they are, as you know, they're great people. Yeah. Um, John is super smart um and and also tough as nails and gets it and um he yeah he has he he has helped me um a lot think about how we do this and um fortunately we haven't had we haven't had the 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 the, the like the conference road trips is what i'm anxious to see if like if we go to atlanta are we gonna have a bunch of requests that we should just do something the night before at the hotel right. so we're prepared to do those things. It hasn't quite happened yet where we've needed to do it. Um, but 
yeah, John has offered some great advice and, you know, how to, you know, how to, how to manage that. And, and, um, yeah, he's been, he's been terrific. He's been very, very helpful, um, you know, in the background here and, um, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully we'll have a deep run and, you know, have to utilize some of our conversations, but even well, just hearing somebody has been through it. And by the way, went through it on 162 game schedule compared to what I have to do. Right. I mean, he had, True. he had it far tougher than, yeah. than I've got it. So Coach, I, I, Coach I, isn't signing autographs till one o'clock in the morning, no, the way Cal was. No, he's time. in, we're in, we're out. It's indoors. You know what I mean? There's not, yeah. uh, it, 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 it works out well. So, um, okay. So I got it before I go then. Yep. All right. I got to ask you guys, you know, is Elias going to get this thing done? And when <laughs> can we expect, cause I have, I, we have a bunch of Orioles fans down here. Yeah. Live among Yankees and Red Sox fans, at what point does the worm turn here and we start feeling better about things? <laughs> well, I'm Gar, just gonna, do you have I'm any gonna, ideas on that, Gar? Well, I'm going to, Stan, you and I have talked about this. Yeah. John, uh, John, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to let Stan handle it for the most part because he is the baseball guy, number one. And number two, I think Stan is a little bit more optimistic than I am. I am the eternal optimist, uh, despite the fact that the club would always view me in my heyday on the air as this rabble rouser that was always negative and knocking things. I think Mike's got a plan. I just hope he's he can he can pull it off because I think the Orioles are going to be a lot better by 2024. I think they will be a lot better offensively. I don't know with the price of pitching where it's going, how we're ever going to be able to really compete with some of those teams, yeah. but we'll see. I mean, yeah. he's a very smart guy. There's no question about it. Yeah. And the, the talent is going to start to percolate, but there's not an awful lot of pitching talent within the organization. Yeah. That, yeah. That's kind of my take on it. I, I know they have one really good starter coming. The Rodriguez, Grayson, yeah. Grayson Rodriguez. Yeah. And it sounds like we'll see the catcher this year. Yep. Um, and hopefully we can with, the, I know we have the one pick again, right. Or the two, maybe the one, or we got I the, think one we've got the, I think we've got the two. I'm okay. not sure and if I, it's one or two. Yeah. I'm not but sure. Hopefully they actually don't like go under slot and we actually get yeah. a dude, you know, but, uh, well, but there's got, some, there were some things I saw last year that it's like, you like got some guys that can hit a little bit, you know, like Mount Castle's a good little player. Like Mount they, Castle's you know, going to be yeah, a very Holland, nice player. You yeah. got some things coming that you feel like, okay, maybe, but you know, we go sign, you know, we go sign Jordan Lyles who give you some innings, but you know, these other dudes are going to get Max Scherzer, you know, it's different. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, yeah. Buck, I think Buck Showalter is going to end up with this Mets job, with the Mets which, job. I keep yeah. which is good for him. Yeah. I keep that. Yeah. John, well, you're, you're a good friend. Yep. And I know you're a loyal Orioles fan. I am. It's Dude, gonna we've be, been there. We go every year. It's going to be tough a couple yeah, a couple more okay. seasons, I think. We'll stick with it. Hey, we'll hey John, let me, let me just close with this, just a comment. You had said earlier, you know, back in the day when Maryland was in the ACC, that this was that the Xfinity Center wasn't a building that you particularly wanted to come to because you yep. knew what was ahead of you. Well, let me tell you this. Being a Maryland fan, I can give you the opposite of that. Since we're not in the ACC anymore, we really miss when Duke comes to town yeah, because yeah. there was nothing like Duke, Maryland in its heyday. I, this was a crazy, crazy town for that game. A hundred percent agree. Um, the games were, I, I mean, they were incredible. And I mean, I remember packing up. I was at the scorer's table keeping, you know, I was keeping the visiting book and um, we're down 10 you know, and you know where I'm going here. I, I, I packed was up. Like I yep. literally put my thing in my bag and I just went and sat by our bench. Cause I'm like, we got to get off, off the court. Cause they're going to run rush the court and we got to get our team off. And, uh, and then all of a sudden it's, it kept going down and then it, we end up tying. I go back to the, it was weird, you know, like I went back to my other position, but, <laughs> um, but man, we had some, you know, Stevie Blake and Dixon and Baxter. And, you know, I mean, they just crazy crazy talent on the floor and then the coaches were all you know like gary would get them like it was it was you didn't know you didn't know what the heck was gonna happen i mean it was 
every time we went up there, it's like, oh, I've never seen this one before. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it was, it was, uh, it was always something special. It was. John, thank many thanks for doing this. Thank You're you so much. Friend. And yeah. it's really great to get some insights into what this is, is like and what it means to coach and yep. what it means to the fans of Duke, uh, Duke basketball. Program. Yeah. Thank you. He's, he's the best. I'm going to, I'm, I'm glad I'm going to still see him every day come into the office. Uh, hopefully he'll be, you know, not in coach mode all the time and, and we can, you know, we can enjoy a cup of coffee together and not stress, you know, maybe but, he'll wear that Cubs hat again. I uh, it's an all timer, man. It's like, it's like, <laughs> it's unbelievable, but uh, no, I appreciate, appreciate you guys having me on and hopefully right. I didn't embarrass anybody here. So right. thanks John Jackson, right. yep. John Jackson. There he is. Deputy Director of Athletics, Men's Basketball, and External Affairs at Duke University. I'll be back Monday night with Ross Grimsley. Ross and I will have one as our guest, newest member of the Hall of Fame, Tim Kirchian, who's going Ooh. in as a baseball writer uh, extraordinaire. And we'll talk to Tim at 5 o'clock on Monday. Thanks again, John. I'll talk to you soon. Gary, I'll talk to you soon. You got it. Thanks, guys.